Well, class, we're down here to the last lecture of the semester, class Y. And I thought it would be appropriate to ease up as folks are getting tense uh, with the end of the semester with their schoolwork to have a introductory level class for the last one. And that's going to be on a very important topic called the Bohr model. And one in which light is considered as a photon carrying off energy, HF, as electron makes a transition from one level to the other. I encountered this in a chemistry class, and you've probably seen it before. It's typically in chemistry, although my my dear colleague, Dex, the late Dexter Squibb, uh, who's taught at UNCA for many years, three decades, he, he never did it in his introductory book. He wrote a book for introductory chemistry, and he didn't do it. It's the area of physical chemistry. So there is some leeway when teachers teach courses what to cover. Now, in your physics intro class, they have uh, part one, the first semester's mechanics and some thermodynamics, maybe a little bit of sound in there too. And then in the second semester, they have E and M, electricity, magnetism, optics, and modern physics, maybe. They may not get that far, but that's the other place where you might see it. And uh, if you didn't get it there, and if you had someone like Dr. Squibb in chemistry, you may have not seen it. And it's very, very important to see, and I, I don't think it is covered in modern physics. I don't think so. I, don't, I haven't taught that course in many, many years. So it, it's good that we do it. It's very, very important. So, so let's go over this, and the math is all basic. There's uh, no um, advanced, you know, uh, mathematics in in this last part. In fact, most of it's going to be at, most of it's going to be algebra, but very, very powerful result. Uh, the idea, and it's nice to see how the experiment came first with spectra of elements and the spectrum of hydrogen, and then how an empirical formula by Balmer was made to describe some of the lines, the visible lines, and how Rydberg, or Rydberg, uh, came along and generalized the formula, and then how Bohr and Rutherford came up with a model before quantum mechanics. It's a semi-classical model, and that means, uh, it's not a full-blown development of quantum mechanics, and because of that, it fails for any other atom. You can't use it for helium, lithium, and all the other atoms. It only works for hydrogen, but it's so, so insightful, and it's an excellent example of data coming first, and then a model, a theoretical model coming second to describe the data. Beautiful example of physics at work. And also I'll mention in there that we are connected to Bohr. If we go back with teachers, uh, we have played the genealogy game uh, before and we'll play it again today. So I hope you enjoyed this last class as you go into study for your finals for all kinds of courses that you're taking and I wish you the, the best luck there. And also in our class we will consider the characteristic of light in terms of its being a wave or a particle. And we'll see that Newton started out with a particle idea, and for many years that held, and then the wave bottle took over. But then when Einstein came along with the photoelectric effect, that confused everybody because that was back to a particle model, and how could you have both? A particle's localized like a marble and a wave is spread out. And that's uh, part of what was handled by quantum mechanics in 1925. We won't be getting to that. That's another course that you take, but at least we'll look at early quantum ideas. All right, let's get started with the class on the Bohr model and the photon. Chapter Why, our last class, photons. 
y zero. A little review, overview of our course. Our optics course consisted of mostly geometrical optics and physical optics. Geometrical and physical optics. Geometrical optics like traveling in straight lines. Physical optics would be light as wave. Notice that physical optics includes the direction of the wave, like the ray. And then quantum optics is not part of our course, really, but we're going to talk a little bit about the photon today, because this is the quantum of electromagnetic energy, the photon. And you've encountered this in, in chemistry class and in our class when we had electrons going from one orbit to another level of energy and then giving off light. So let's uh, look at this. You know, you can think of geometrical optics as specializing in reflection and refraction. And then physical optics, diffraction, and interference. And you could add polarization there. So why section one, light, wave or particle? This brings us to uh, two of the greatest physicists in history, Sir Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. Newton believed that light consisted of particles and the wave model, you know, took over after, eventually, after a while. His status, though, kept the particle model alive for many years. In fact, when Fresnel was writing that paper, remember the committee members, three of them were corpuscularists, or corpuscles, and believing that light consisted of particles. And it's Einstein, with his photoelectric effect, he will show that light behaves as a particle. Newton had an interesting idea for the particle model for reflection and refraction. Reflection is no problem because little, little BBs, the balls, would, if they hit a surface, a flat surface, they would reflect the way light does. And here we neglect gravity, say we're up in the space shuttle or something doing the experiment. And for refraction, he envisioned two media, here's air and here's glass, as like different levels of planes, and then a marble, say, coming along like this, slides down the incline, and you would get then some, eventually, you know, bending toward the normal. But the problem is the particle speeds up. And we know that light travels slower in glass, but they did know that at the time of Newton. So it's a, that's the controversy. Huygens was a contemporary of Newton, proposed the wave idea. Remember the Huygens, Fresnel, wave fronts, and they're at principle, which are referred to as the baby waves. But it wasn't until young, 1800, with a two slit interference and then Fresnel about a decade or so after that you know working around that same time but then writing that essay where the the wave aspect picked up so let's look at the properties of light 
if we look at, say, the phenomenon, now we have the wave and we have the particle, and we're going to do like a scoreboard. So we have reflection, one point for the wave, because the waves, when they hit, hit a surface, they're gonna, they're gonna reflect, not a problem, and particles, not a problem. If we go to refraction, we have seen with the marching soldiers analogy that the waves can explain refraction, but the particles, particle volume is not zero. I suppose you could consider partial credit, I guess, because bend toward the normal the incline, but since the speed is going to be wrong, it's a zero. Then if we look at diffraction interference, let's put diffraction next. Diffraction, you need to have a wave, particle gets zero. And then for interference, one for the wave, zero for the particle. And if we add polarization, one for the wave, zero for the particle. So if you tally this up, and this takes us to close to like 1900, because that's around the time where, well, 1905, you know, Einstein will write the paper on the foot electric effect, but around 1900 and earlier, this is a score of five to one. Here, wins, actually in physics, you, you have to have uh, no exceptions. So that looks bad for the particles. Now, Y2, light as wave dash particle. And this story about light acting or being thought of as a particle in modern times begins in 1900, where Max, Max Planck quantized the energy for an oscillator. Now in modern physics, we have quantum mechanics, that's 1925, and relativity, 1905, but this is kind of like the beginning of quantum ideas, where if you take a harmonic oscillator, which has kinetic energy and potential energy, and remember that this is a system of Bain Hooke's law. You have a little particle, if you pull to the right, the force wants to pull you back. If you push in here, it wants to pull, wants to pull you back, so that basically it's, I'm gonna have these little arrows indicate that it's like oscillating, like back and forth. Harmonic oscillator. And you measure X from the center. Now, when you get to the edge, if we call that the amplitude A, like when X is maxed out, then momentarily you have the particle mass stops, uh, momentarily it's gonna go back the other way. So velocity is zero. And at that point, it's all kinetic energy. And this is equal to a constant. So you can think of this kinetic energy plus potential energy as being a total equal to one half Ka squared. And in the sense of classical thinking, A can be anything. You can have any, any amount. It's a continuous variable. And Max Planck says this energy of the oscillator will be in quant quantum units like the energy would be some n, where n is say like zero, one, two, three, four, five, h times the frequency. That's the Planck constant named after him. And that's the frequency of the oscillator. 
Let's look at Max Planck here. The young Max Planck, younger on the left, the older Max Planck on the right. German theoretical physicist, known especially for his energy quanta, which we might consider here the birth of quantum physics and the Nobel Prize being awarded in 1918. The Planck constant is very, very small, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. And this, uh, by the way, is sometimes referred to as action. And since it's so small, it's so grainy, very, very tiny, that we don't notice these quantum effects in, for, say, playing on a swing, a playground, or, and everything looks continuous to us. But when quantum mechanics is developed later in 1925, we have a probability interpretation of the particle so you really can't think in terms of the A incrementing a little bit more and a little bit more for the energy levels. It's not quite work that way because quantum mechanics has a probability of finding the particle at different places, but the energy is still quantized and the energy is in quantum mechanics is N uh, here plus a half HF. So when n is equal to zero, you do have some energy. While in Planck's case, uh, that was not the case. But main thing is, is that the delta energy, because all the n's, n, one, two, three, four, they increment by one, you get the same result for both Planck and the modern you know, theory in, in quantum mechanics. So little chunks of HF, H being very, very small. But then comes this problem, the photoelectric effect where, where light, this is called the photoelectric effect where light comes in like photo, that's where the photo comes from, the light. Photo meaning light coming in and it kicks off electrons only when the light has a certain frequency. This is a problem for the wave model because if you wanted to have more, more waves, just make the amplitude greater, but that didn't kick off the electrons. You had to go from like, say, red light to like ultraviolet light. And then it, it didn't matter if you had just very dim light or not, the electrons start getting kicked off. And that's where Einstein comes along and says that the energy in the photons, say the particle of light, or light really consists of quanta. You might think of take, he's taking Planck seriously with the harmonic oscillator. That you drop, drop down to different levels and you change by H, F, Basically, Einstein is saying that's sh shaking off a photon with HF. Planck, by the way, was trying to study the effect of if you had, say, glowing walls and you had a temperature making you know, the walls get more, more energetic, you would find that the color of the walls, like think of a kiln, if you're in the kiln, that you glow, say, red hot, and then brighter is yellow hot. And then when you get in the middle of the spectrum, it's like white hot. And that's referred to in the modern physics class as a study of black body radiation. Since if you shine light in, it absorbs it, but also it's emitted it. So it's an equilibrium. Could have called it a white body. That's historical terminology. Let's look at the Nobel Prizes. Max Planck, 1918, in recognition of the services he rendered to the advancement of physics by his discovery of energy quanta. Albert Einstein, 1921, for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. 
So what Einstein is basically saying is that when a particle of light hits the metal, the energy is HF, and as F, the frequency increases to go to blue, to ultraviolet, like X-ray, and in that fashion, at some point, there's enough kick in the photon so that an electron does get kicked out. And if the frequency is not high enough, then it doesn't matter how much light you have, how many red photons or infrared photons you have, you're not going to get the effect. Okay. So now we come back to the scoreboard. There we go, there's a scoreboard. And then when we add photoelectric in our list, wave gets a zero, particle gets a one. This is devastating because in physics, if one exception to the rule is found, like you're in big trouble, so this like shoots Shoots everything apart on the wave end here. But now we know that light behaves as a wave particle. There's a duality, wave particle duality. And in our current model, we have embraced both wave and particle aspects. And that also applies to matter. So the electronics itself behaves as a particle and as a wave. When they shine electrons through two close slits, they got interference pattern where you would have electrons, lots of them, and not none, and then lots of them, and not as many. Very fascinating, and that's studied in your quantum mechanics course. So now we go to Y3. We're gonna to talk today about the Bohr atom. That's gonna be our main discussion. And we're gonna talk about things that lead up to the Bohr atom or the Bohr model. And the first takes us to a high school teacher, had a doctor degree, and that's Balmer. He's teaching at a school for young ladies in Switzerland. Well, that's kind of cool to have a teacher like that in high school. And he's trying to understand the spectrum of hydrogen. See, so remember we looked at this nice, nice beautiful red line that gives us the beautiful nebulae in astronomy. Here's the North American nebula, the Pelican Nebula. The Pelican's looking at North Carolina. There's Florida, Maine, United States, and then you go down Texas and Mexico, and you know down in here stands to South America. And he he finds a formula, this one here, that empirically gets you these wavelengths. This is the 656, this is the 486, this one here, the violet 434, the 410, and he gets it. And it's kind of neat to like play through this. So I went ahead and worked at some of these for you, where his formula calls for M to be three, four, five, and there's your M. So let's write down his formula. Three, six, four, point five, six nanometers, and then M squared over M squared minus four. M is three, four, five, etc. So if M is equal to three, then you get three squared over three squared minus four. So that's nine over nine minus four, nine fifths. And that, that gets you that nice, beautiful red one, sometimes called the H alpha, alpha line. And the H beta line here is next. And then if you put M as four, you get four squared is 16. And then the 16 minus four is 12. You get the 46. And then with the five, M is five, you get 25 over, this is four less than 25, 21, you get the 434. And then 36, and then 36 minus four is 32, you get 410. And you get more. Now you're in the ultraviolet, but see, these are the visible ones up here, but in the ultraviolet, you would have then the 40, 49 over 49 minus four, 
which is to 45, and that gets you an ultraviolet uh, light. And then here with the 8, 64 over 60, another ultraviolet. And then you can see that these start to get closer and closer to each other. Because as M gets bigger and bigger, then subtracting 4 doesn't really matter much. Like if you have 100 times 100, it's 10,000, and 10,000 minus 4, very close. So if you take the limit here as the M goes to infinity, then you basically are getting a 1 here. And this is going to be the limit. See, that one there. Interesting. Another scientist comes along. Here is Rydberg, also pronounced Rydberg. So Rydberg, the Swedish physicist, known mainly for the Rydberg formula, he generalizes the Balmer formula to describe even more wavelengths. And this showed up in 1888. The Balmer formula started back in 1885, not very, very long, in the past, and let's write down the Balmer one again. 364, and this is an empirical formula, so he doesn't really derive it from any basic physics, but he's playing with the numbers to get things to work out. And this gets the visible lines in the uh, hydrogen atom and more. So what we're going to do is take 1 over lambda and make this 364.56 nanometers in the denominator. And then this becomes m squared minus 4. I'm going to show you how we're going to evolve into the Rydberg formula. And now what we're going to do is divide by the m squared to get 1 minus 4 over m squared. And then the next step, we're going to replace 1 with 4 over 4. Then we're going to factor out the 4 and have 4 over 364.56. 1, this is 1 over 4. We're taking the top 4 out. And this is 1 over m squared. So the top four came out. And then we're going to write this as 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over m squared. And then what Rydberg did is generalize this 2 to be a positive integer. So in other words, make it Another integer like the M, we'll call it N. So 4 over 3, 64.56 nanometers. And this is 1 over N squared minus 1 over M squared. And remember when the M started, for this case, as 3, 4, and 5, it starts, it has to be greater than the 2. This M is going to be greater than the N. So, in other words, the M is going to start out at N plus 1, N plus 2, N plus 3, and so on. So, you can think of the Balmer series of wavelengths as the case where N is 2. But if N is something else, you get other cases. And here is a nice diagram to show those with a little picture. This is not the scale. Uh, we're going to show you what the radii are in the latter part of this class. Uh, so here, if m is 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, you have the Balmer series. So we're going to see in a second that we're going to have a model where at the electron is going to go from, say, 6, this is the 6th orbit, to the 2nd orbit. And, and that gets you your Balmer series. From 3 to 2 is the red light. From 4 to 2, more ener energy. 
because we're going to be looking at E is H times F. As F goes up, the energy goes up. So here's a bigger jump in energy from 5 to 2 and then 6 to 2. Then you could have 7 to 2 and all. And then the numbers start to bunch up a little bit. This is another series, the Lyman series, you're going to end up to n is equal to 1. So in a Lyman series, you know, n is 1, and then m would start at 2, 3, 4, in other words, from the second orbit to the first one, from the third orbit to the first one, and so on. And as you get farther and farther away, notice that the wavelengths get smaller because it's more energy, more like deep into the ultraviolet and heading toward X-ray. Uh, here's another diagram showing the transition of the electron, which we're gonna get into next, that's the model, and then the photon is given off, and this is showing the different levels, and here it's a little hard to see, but these energies start to bunch up, and we're at the energy levels. So the energy levels, we're gonna show you how they go in terms of the N equals one, two, three, four, and we'll uh, show you the radii in the model coming up. So this is the uh, case for the Balmer series, dropping down to the second orbit level, three to two, that's that nice red one, four to two, and more of a cyan, a blue-green one for that, and then the violet, five to two, and six to two, a deeper violet, so they have here sort of a blue and a or violet, yeah. And that brings us to the Bohr model. Now Bohr, the Bohr model, this is Y4, was developed by Bohr and Rutherford. And it's often referred to as the Bohr model. That's like the name we use. Now, Bohr is very special to me, folks, and I hope special to you, since we are connected by a series of teachers. Now, let's look at this. The four degrees of Niels Bohr, I'm taking that by analogy to the game that was invented by U.S. college students in the 1990s, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you pick an actor and they say this actor starred with this actor in this movie, but then in the other movie, that actor starred with that star. And they, you can connect to Kevin Bacon. So like any actor can be connected to Kevin Bacon by like six degrees. So that's kind of cool. Like if someone starred, A starred with B, but then in another movie, B starred with C, and then in another movie, C starred with D. And finally, one of those starred with Kevin Bacon. So here we have Niels Bohr, has Bohr number zero because it's himself. And John Wheeler, one of his students, would be Bohr one, once removed from Bohr one. John Wheeler uh, then taught Charles Misner. So that's Bohr number, that we two. And then I took a course with Charles Misner at the University of Maryland, and that's bore number three, and then you would be bore number four, say. Um, this is fascinating how Wheeler got really interested in general relativity and the Bible of general relativity called Gravitation, published in 1971, was written by Misner, Wheeler, and Kip Thorne at Caltech. And that was the book that that I used when I studied and took a class with Charles Misner. So that's neat to see how we're connected, sort of another genealogy. And you could feel that uh, you're connected to Niels Bohr. Bohr number, student number four. So if we look at uh, Ernest Rutherford, here he is, sometimes known as the father of nuclear physics, known for the Bohr Rutherford model, and known for modern atomic theory and model, and credited with discovery of the proton in 1911. 
Nobel Prize in Chemistry, 1908, for his investigations into the disintegration of the elements and the chemistry of radioactive substances. Niels Bohr, Nobel Prize in Physics, 1922, for his services in the investigation of the structure of atoms and of the radiation emanating from them. Also known for the principle of complementarity in quantum mechanics that applies to wave particle duality, where in some experiments we measure the particle aspects of matter and light, and in other experiments we measure the wave aspects. His son, by the way, born when he got the Nobel Prize, 50 years, about 50 years later, won a Nobel Prize himself, age Bohr, sharing it with two other scientists. And that brought to my mind the mother or daughter Nobel laureates, Marie Curie, and her daughter got a Nobel Prize down the road. And the Curie family's amazing where Marie Curie shared a Nobel Prize with her husband uh, and, and then she, uh, uh, remember, Marie Curie has two Nobel Prizes, the only person with the two in, in that, in the science, in the area of science. And then her, her daughter got one uh, with her husband, and, and then UNICEF was awarded the Nobel Prize, and uh, Marie Curie's like, son-in-law was there to get the prize on behalf of UNICEF. So lots of, lots of Nobel Prizes in that family. Okay, so the Bohr model. So the Bohr model is a very simple uh, planetary model where an electron is going around the proton, which we know can't be true. We, in quantum mechanics, we know that these have to be replaced, these diagrams with probability distributions, but we're before quantum mechanics at this point. So if we look at this, there'll be a force, since the electron's negative and the proton's positive, there'll be attractive force and since the proton is, remember, 1836 times the mass of the electron, we'll take it to be fixed, like infinite mass, mass, and the electron going around the proton. We could consider this distance like R, and we'll be looking at that, and mass of the electron M, or M sub E, since M has been used already in the class for uh, integers. And here, if we look at this uh, electric force, it's the Coulomb force, the force between the two, one over four pi, epsilon naught, charge of the proton, charge of the electron over R squared. And often we just call this constant, uh, the electric constant, Ke, all this stuff out in front. And then here, the proton uh, has a charge E, say the unit charge uh, E, a charge of an electron or proton, but we'll make the E positive. So then the electron will have the negative E. So this is going to be E times negative E over R squared. So the force is minus Ke squared over R squared. And we're just going to be doing introductory physics this class. The last class we already mentioned, and we want uh, sort of to be a relaxing kind of review and focus on the particle aspects of light. And let's review some physics at F equals ma. And since we have circular motion, the acceleration is v squared over r. And I'm going to put a minus sign there because the force is toward the center, and I'm gonna call outward as positive, so inward toward the center, say a zero point there on the radius, would be a negative force. So these minus signs would then cancel, and you would get m, and I'll go ahead and put mass of the electron there to emphasize, mv squared over r is ke, e squared over r squared, so that's that's Newton's law where you plug in the Coulombic force for the force on the electron. Then another nice little review of introductory physics is that you got your kinetic energy plus your potential. And we know your potential energy is obtained by thinking that negative derivative on the potential energy is gonna give you your force. 
So this is gonna help us figure out what the potential energy is since we know what the force is. The force is minus K E squared over R squared. All right, that's the force inward, you know, pulling toward the, the center. So what do we need here for you? Well, if you're gonna have one over R squared, your potential energy here is going to be a one over R rule. Now let's just check this because we might guess the sign wrong if we're not careful. If you take the derivative of one over R, you get minus one over R squared. So if you get what that, then let's just go ahead and do it. Minus du dr. There's this minus sign out in front, but then you have this minus ke with the ke squared. And then now you're taking the derivative of the one over r, and this is going to be a minus sign. So you have three minus signs. So that means you'll have a minus sign, and then you'll have ke e squared, and then you'll be over r squared, and that is the force. So like, we're good, like that's it. So this is the potential energy. And we can write then for the energy of the system, one half mv squared minus ke e squared over r. That's a nice, a nice uh, equation. So you have like these two basic equations. Then for the next step, we would like to get rid of uh, the velocity here so we can have uh, an equation with the r to find those uh, distances we had mentioned we were gonna be interested in that. So if that's the case, then if we look at this equation, MeV squared is going to be equal, if I take the r on the other side, it'll be Ke squared over r, and then if I take that and put it in here, then I have for the en energy, I have one half of Ke e squared over R. And then I have minus Ke e squared over R. Now you may notice the similarity here and there's an important theorem called the Varial Theorem, which you learn in other class in a more advanced level and it might be grad school, that this happens in, in a sort of a general way with uh, other forces, conservative forces that you could work with. But see, this is kind of nice how this is gonna work. You have one and half of this, then you subtract the whole one. So if you do that, you'll wind up with minus a half. So another cool formula. And now we're ready for the model. Now, first thing is that we got a big, big problem. If you have an electron in orbit, that's a charge. And if the charge is in orbit, it's accelerating. Because you remember acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration is V squared over R. Well, if you're accelerating, you'll shake off electromagnetic radiation you lose energy and you'll spiral into the proton as you lose your energy, dropping down lower and lower and in your orbit. And that means the uh, hydrogen atom will not exist. It will like self-destruct. That means atoms won't exist. That means you won't exist. But we know you have a Bohr number four. You do exist. So this doesn't happen. And this is where Bohr and Rutherford come out with new laws, laws that's overrule traditional laws of physics, like the acceleration gives off electromagnetic radiation in classical physics. So the first postulate, postulate one, is that an electron in orbit around a proton does not radiate. They just say it, override, override the classical rule of electromagnetic theory. Postulate two 
is, and here comes the biggie. Well, another, they're all, these are all biggies, sorry. But this one here, they quantize angular momentum. The angular momentum is quantized. Bri a brilliant statement. Angular momentum, which is uh, for a circle, is a mass times the velocity times r. You can think of this as your momentum. And since the momentum is perpendicular to the moment arm coming from the center, if this is your r, 90 degrees, then uh, your you would take a m. This well, let's say this is m v your momentum, and that's m v r, and that's equal to n times h bar, where h bar is the Planck constant divided by two pi. They quantize, see this theme of quantizing is uh, now repeating. You had Planck quantized harmonic oscillator energy levels, and they came in quantum uh, like jumps, and then Einstein quantized electromagnetic radiation, a photon, now we're quantizing angular momentum. And then postulate three is that a photon is emitted when the electron drops, we'll say from higher to lower orbit. And given by then like the delta E is your change in your energy, we'll see, we're gonna see that's gonna be your HF. So uh, we're going to add more detail uh, to these things. Now, I can't resist showing you a cool derivation of quantization of angular momentum, fast-forwarding to 1924, where we have the de Broglie relation, which says that the wavelength is h over p, and p is h over lambda, so we're looking at, see, the electron here as being a matter wave, and that came later. So if the electron here is a wave, so that it has an integral number of wavelengths in the orbit, then you would say 2 pi r is n lambda to fit the wave in there. And since the wavelength is h over p, this is then replace h over p, but then if you take the P and bring it to the other side to have P times R and then divide by the two pi, you get it. This is it. Because P times R is angular momentum and this is NH bar. That is, that is wild. So if we fast forward one decade to get to the de Broglie relation, we can then wrap a matter wave say, around the circumference and get this result which is what Bohr and Rutherford are postulating. Okay. Here's our quantization of angular momentum. And this other equation we have from the other page is your F equals MA. Your acceleration is your V squared over R. And that force is the Coulombic force equal to Coulombic force which is on the right-hand side. So this is, you can think of this as F equals MA. This is the MA. It had a minus sign in front because it's pointing inward. And this one here would have a minus sign in front because it's an attractive force pointing inward. And you can kind of write this down without looking back in the earlier notes because this is your force, MA, mass times acceleration. And this is your Coulombic force. So what I would like to do is here, first of all, get rid of the H bar. I'd rather have the, the H and the two pi specifically, you know, you know, written down. So then the velocity here is NH over MER times uh, two pi. See, what I would like to do is solve for R to find that radius, uh, radii. So this has to go up in here. So if I do that, uh, I'm going to have, well, first of all, I have ME over R. 
And you know, I'm thinking here might be, well, we could multiply both sides, but we'll do that in a second. So then this is N H over, I'll write the two pi first, M E R like this squared is K E squared over R squared. And I like to do two things now, a couple of things. I like to square this out. I like to also get rid of one of these R's. So let's uh, do it. Let's see if we can do both of those. We have N squared, H squared, if I square this, and then the two gets squared, four, the pi gets squared, pi squared. Now when the N gets squared, this M will cancel. So I'll have just, we'll cancel one of them. So I'll have just M E. And then this will be R squared down in here. And if you, well, we'll go ahead and make that R cubed then because this R is hanging around. Then we'll, we'll multiply both sides in a second with the R, R squared. So here, N squared, H squared, two squared, pi squared, M squared got knocked down a power because of that M. And then R squared went up a power because of that R. And then what I'm gonna do is multiply both sides by R cubed. And if I do that, then I get N squared H squared over four pi squared M E, and that's equal to K squared. Now this K, it's probably good to keep the little E on there because I did use K in the class as a spring constant. So let's do that. And then this is going to be an R because R cubed it goes away here, but then over here, multiply by R cubed, you have R cubed over R squared. So here I have my R basically there. I'm gonna put in the R sub N since it depends on the N, the different levels, and it'll be N squared, H squared, and it will be divided by here four pi squared M E, and then the K E, E squared. But now remember the K is one over four pi epsilon naught. So if I throw that in here, I'm gonna flip it and if I flip that, let's go ahead and do it. I have n squared, h squared. That's gonna flip up in the numerator. And then I have a four pi squared, me, and then e squared. So now if we look at this, we can see that this four will cancel that four and one of the pi's will wind up down, down here. So you have an n squared, The n squared h squared, and I'm gonna put that epsilon naught out in front, and then one of these pi's will cancel one in the denominator, so I have one pi there, and I have this cool formula. So n squared h squared, epsilon naught, one of the pi's cancel, force cancel, and have m e e squared, this is it. And you can see that the radii here, they go as n squared. That if you're actually to draw a picture, you'd have to space them. Since everything else is a constant, you'd basically space them uh, with n squared. And a real special one called the Bohr radius is the first one. So if we take r sub one, then the n is one. And we have this formula. And that's the Bohr radius. You know, it gets a little, little tedious to put in these weird numbers, but it's good to do that. I mean, here's the epsilon, not the permittivity of free space. There's the Planck constant using here the MKS system. And that's the way you get meters. And here is the mass of the electron. It has to be kilograms, say. And then here, the charge, it would be in the MKS system, coulombs. And then when you do that, you get this real cool result, the famous result that the Bohr radius is a half an angstrom. That is nice. And remember that an angstrom is equal to 10 to the minus 10th meters. And remember your nanometer is 10 to the minus 9th meters, which means 10 little angstroms there equals one nanometer. 
think of the nanometer as like a dime, and this is like a penny, and 10 pennies give you a dime. Now we're gonna go after the energy. How's the energy get spaced? Well, the energy equation from the other page, and this is related to that virial theorem that I mentioned, is given by this formula, all right? So that one, we would like to take the R and stick it in down there to get the energy levels. Now, when we do this, you can think of the R as being flipped. We gotta flip the R, so if we have E is minus one half, I'm gonna put the E squared down, and I'm gonna go ahead and put down the one over four pi epsilon naught for this. So the, the only thing I have left here is the one over R. That's the only thing left. The one half is there, the minus sign is there, this is the K, E one over four pi epsilon naught, and the E squared is there. So I need, I need to flip this thing. So I need uh, pi me e squared, and then I need to uh, put what was upstairs down in the denominator like this. And now you can see that the energy immediately, you can see that the energy goes as one over n squared. That means as uh, you get farther and farther away to get space closer and closer uh, together. In fact, uh, uh, here, like if you had one, you'd have a one, but then you would have, if it's two, it's a one-fourth, and if it's a three, it's a one-ninth, right? So that's how the energy levels are going, but remember that as you go to zero, that's infinity, because remember when you set this up, the potential energy, potential energy one is one over R, so that means your reference is at infinity because there's a minus sign, say, in front of all these, these minus like this. So you're getting closer and closer on the negative side, getting bunched up closer and closer to each other as, as the zero is the ceiling. So, you know, you're going something like, like, like this, say, like that, say, and this would be uh, the uh, zero reference. Let's go ahead and clean it up in a second. This is minus one over eight. And then this is uh, here, mass of the electron. Uh, I'm gonna anticipate this pi canceling, but this is e to the fourth power, that's wild. e to the fourth power. And then I have here an epsilon naught squared, and then I have an n squared h squared. That's why they drew these energy levels getting closer and closer. Like in other words, way up in here, when n goes infinity, you get zero. So if that's, you know, if that's the zero line up there, when n goes infinity, you get zero. Then like when n is one, you have some negative value. So here they had n is two, so n, n is one would be down there. But see, these are the energy levels and they, they, they do something like this. All right. Okay, now uh, when we look at the ground state, this is the nth case. If you want the ground state, you're going to put in here the minus one eighth me e to the fourth over epsilon naught squared h squared. And once again, the numbers are very, very awkward <laughs> to work with, but putting in all the numbers, you get the value in joules, and then if you convert from joules to electron volts, remember we talked about this, minus 13.6 electron volts, to kick an electron out of the hydrogen atom from its ground state. That would be like ionizing the hydrogen. Electron gets kicked out, man, it's gone. You go from the lowest energy, and you want it to bring it to zero. Remember, zero energy level is like the reference like infinitely away from the proton. So now we're ready to do the, the conclusion that when you look at this energy here, if you take the delta from going from say here, we're gonna go from N, say we go from M to N, because remember the way we set this up, M has to be greater than N for the transitions. You want E M, 
minus e n, so that's minus one over eight, you have m e e to the fourth, epsilon naught squared, and here you're going to have h squared, but see, this is gonna factor out, it's gonna be one over m squared minus one over n squared. Now this is, this is amazing. See, this is what we had with the Rydberg. Remember, we had this, we saw this, and you know, we had a little, um, like two squared. This minus sign is gonna go ahead and flip that around for us. But remember, this is HF, and remember that the frequency times the wavelength is the speed, so that means the frequency is C over lambda. I wanna basically write this down for F. So this is gonna be H C over lambda. That was the main thing. Once when we get this far, what I'm really interested in is the wavelength in terms of the energy levels. So if I go one over lambda, which is, I need to divide by the H and the C. So here on this side, I'm gonna take that minus sign in and flip this. So uh, for now, I'm gonna write down M E E to the fourth, and then down here, we're gonna have the eight, and we're gonna have the epsilon naught squared, but now the H, because this H is gonna to come to the bottom here, that's gonna be H cubed, and the C is gonna go down there with it. And then I'm gonna have the minus sign come in and flip these. And now that looks, this is amazing because we get the Rydberg formula and the constant. Like this is uh, the Rydberg constant. We call that with a little h to emphasize that it's for uh, the proton. Need to point out that the Bohr model does not work for helium or any other elements. You need quantum mechanics. But it's amazing that it works. This hydrogen is being understood by this. So if we look at this formula, and write down what this is with all this stuff in here. Once again, we get into messy, messy numbers. And when we do that, this is the Rydberg constant. And then once when we get this, what I did for you is I took it and I wanted to multiply by top and bottom by four and arrange it so it starts to look like what we had earlier, and we're gonna get, we're gonna derive the Balmer formula. So at this point, what we're doing is we're going to go back to what we did earlier in the class where we had Rydberg, and we arrived at his formula from the Balmer formula, and here is the Rydberg formula, the generalization, and see this is the constant out in front, and when we put in all the numbers to figure out what that constant is, then when you look at its equivalent to four over the 364.5. Now, we didn't exactly get the same thing, but remember our model is that this proton is infinitely massive, which is not the case. So we don't expect to have 100% agreement, but look, we are agreeing here to several significant figures. I mean, this is amazing. So we, we, derive, we derive what the Rydberg constant is with all these parameters. That's very, very cool. Well, one last thing I'd like to do is show you here, a cool derivation of orbit radii. Inspired by Feynman seeing a similar calculation that he did, uh, we're going to look at the energy one half mv squared and then here's your potential energy. 
and we're taking the uh, angular momentum, which is MVR, that's gonna be quantized. But you know that this angular momentum is a constant for the orbits, because angular momentum is conserved when you have a central force. And since it's conserved, we can write down here for the velocity is gonna be a constant divided by MER. So when I plug this V into there, I'm gonna have here one half ME L over MER squared minus KE E squared over R. And if I work this out, I will get here one half constant squared L and then here the ME squared in the denominator will drop down one power because there's an ME in front, and then I'll have one over R squared, and then minus KE e squared over R. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, minimize the energy by doing a max min problem from calculus, V dr, and this is one half, this is a constant, L squared, this is a constant, mass of the electron, and this is gonna get me a minus two over R cubed. Take the derivative of one over R squared, you bring down the minus two, and then you add the power goes minus two minus one is gonna be the R to the minus three. And then here, this is gonna be KE E squared. If I take the derivative of one over R, I get minus one over R squared equal to zero. So now the next step, what we'll do is Let's go ahead and knock off this two. L squared over ME R cubed. And then here, there'll be a minus sign. And then over here, there'll be a plus sign. KE E squared over R squared equals zero. So we can put one on either side of the equation. L squared over ME R cubed is KE E squared over R squared. Multiply both sides by R cubed. Divide to get R by itself one side of the equation. Get rid of the KE, which is one over four pi epsilon naught. So that's gonna be here. If we take that away from the denominator, we have to put the four pi epsilon naught upstairs. And now quantization, L is NH bar, which is NH over two pi. So when that goes in, we get four pi Epsilon naught, MEE squared. You get the N squared, you get the H squared, and you have the four pi squared. Fours cancel. You're gonna get an epsilon naught up there, N squared, H squared, over in the denominator, one pi by itself, MEE squared. And now let's look carefully up here, same thing. We just did it. Isn't that nice? Nice? Isn't that nice? Well, class, our course has come to the end. I've enjoyed teaching this class. And you know, the last time I taught this class, I look like this. I mean, we're talking like, like 40 years ago. I mean, this is wild. Amazing how the time goes by. That was a long time ago, but my whole career has been spent at UNC Asheville. And I've enjoyed it very much and still do. Have a nice break.